Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, is my volume okay? Let's make sure. Okay, good. Um, so thank you so much for coming. For those of you who've come to an Allies event in the past, thank you for coming back. And for those of you who are new, um, thank you for coming today. I'm really excited to bring to you this uh, event um, and hope that we walk away with a, a, a learning a lot more uh, together. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, Allies in Prevention uh, started over 20 years ago, actually. This is the, the 20th anniversary Allies in Prevention event. Um, as, a, as a group of um, child advocacy and child welfare professionals who wanted to work together on common issues, common training, so that every child, every family who engaged with child advocacy across Northern Virginia experienced something consistent and trauma-informed. Um, and so we'll continue to do that work. Um, and so when you hear Allies in Prevention or you see one of those events, that's what you can expect. Um, and so we're really grateful for everybody who over that last 20 years has been a part of that work. Um, so why we chose today's topic, um, probably of no surprise to anyone. Um, when we first started thinking about Allies in Prevention this year, thinking about the last two years and what we've all experienced, um, we've been in front of screens, we're in front of screens now. Um, and so have our children. Um, and so thinking about our work differently, thinking about how do we continue to uplift and support um, our youth at the same time we're keeping them safe online. Um, and so today's uh, keynote and our panelists are the perfect fit for this conversation. So I'm incredibly excited uh, to learn along with you. Um, so I'd like to pass the spotlight along now to our board chair, Marty Abbott, um, to say a few words. You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Leah. Thanks for that warm welcome. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for SCAN's annual Allies in Prevention gathering. I'm excited to be here today, not just as SCAN's board president, but also as a lifelong educator who has worked with educators and young people in schools and seen firsthand how evolving technology and social media has changed youth culture. That's why I'm so happy to be introducing you to today's keynote speaker, Rosalind Weissman. She's an expert in youth culture and the founder of Cultures of Dignity, an organization working with communities to shift the way we think about young people's physical and emotional well being. You may recognize her, however, as the author of multiple New York Times bestsellers, including Masterminds and Wingmen and Queen Bees and Wannabes, the groundbreaking book that was ba the basis for the movie and Broadway musical Mean Girls. Over the years, national media has relied on Rosalind as an expert in youth parenting, bullying prevention, and mediating conflict. She has been profiled in the New York Times, People Magazine, Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, The Washington Post, and USA Today. She's a frequent guest on national media like the Today Show, CNN, and NPR affiliates throughout the country. She has truly influenced generations of young people, and that's why I'm thrilled to be having her join us today to speak about what life online is like for youth and how we can better support them. Thank you, Rosalind, for being here, and I'm turning over the platform to you. Okay, thank you. Wow. Um, generations of young people. Oh my goodness. Um, I think they are, they're influencing me um, and never, never stop. So we have so many wonderful things to cover today. And we have a wonderful panel as well. So um, I'm going to actually check in with all of you today to begin. Um, because I believe that many people who are, are here and we are in community right now together intentionally to be here together, to support each other, to learn from each other. Um, but I wanna first see how you all are doing. So I am using also, by the way, if you haven't seen it, um, a platform called Prezi. So things are gonna come up right with me or take my place. So here's our first thing. I would like for you to think about, and you can put this in the chat, to want, want you to choose two words that describe how you're feeling right now. So I'm gonna give you about 
20 seconds to just think about, <clears throat> excuse me, and just come into our space together and think about intentionally, how are you coming into this space? So if you can put that in the chat, two words that you're feeling, that would be great. Thank you all so much for doing this. All right. So let's get, let's go to, we feel so many different things. I'm gonna to talk to you about um, the connection between youth culture, um, sort of the larger concepts that I think help ground me in working with young people. Um, and the first one is what is it that makes us happy? And for young people, I think there's a sense of, and I'm gonna talk about culture because um, I've been asked to talk about youth culture. Culture is everything you know, but have never been sat down and taught explicitly. You just know, you absorb it. And so um, actually th this definition of happiness is in some ways counter-cultural. So the definition of happiness here is meaning beyond oneself, a hope of success, not a guarantee, meaningful social connection, satisfying work, and a place to process and find peace. Now, I've been asked by SCAN to be here to talk about young people and their culture and, and social media and technology. And I want us to think about this because just in this definition of happiness, we can see the positives of technology and also the challenges of technology. So, um, so really what we can see, and I'm gonna show you um, something coming from my colleague, Devorah Heitner, is that instead of saying to kids they're addicted to technology, I have found that it's much more helpful to connect and say to them that technology is about three buckets. It is about connection. It is about creating things because you certainly young people create wonderful, incredible things using technology. And it is also about consuming and it's about consuming information. And so one of the things I think is most important about um, our gathering today is that we are here to be able to understand that our anxiety or our feelings about technology are less important in some ways than how our way in which we are transferring information to young people about technology is. We are transferring and want to communicate information to young people about something that they know a lot about. And we have to be honest with ourselves, be able to admit to ourselves when we are saying things to them that make young people shut down. And so I have found that doing this bucket um, is really helpful about connecting, creating, and consuming as a way of talking to young people about social media. So we're gonna keep going because I think this concept for me is actually the most powerful when I'm talking to young people, which is, the concept of the invisible audience, that they're needing to, that culture is everything you know, but have never been sat down and taught, but you just know from the invisible audience what they want to see. Or when you are posting something, or when you are contributing something, you are thinking about pleasing this invisible audience. And where do you get these messages from? You get them from this constant barrage of information where you realize, where you don't realize, excuse me, that you're being taught cultural mores and things about what will make you happy or what will not make you happy. And so one of the things I have found for young people is to be able to always frame these issues in terms of their autonomy and agency, which they want and deserve. And to be able to share with them that if we are not aware of how this invisible audience is controlling the way they perceive what they post, how they um, share information about themselves, that they are not in control of themselves the way that they themselves want to be. And I think it, it's a very easy, and I think young people agree with this, that any control that they in some ways think that adult authorities in, the, in their lives have over them in some ways is nothing compared to the way Instagram has over them or that Snapchat or TikTok has over them. And so this is really at base about autonomy and self-agency. And that is the way in which I constantly approach it with young people. Now, having said that, at the same time, how do we get to a place where they want to engage with us? Because 
what, as I said a few minutes ago, the way in which we talk to young people matters. And we have to acknowledge that the way in which they're usually spoken to about technology is counterproductive. So I'm going to share with you what I think is, again, what, what is helpful. So I usually start off and I ask them the questions of, I say, this is, you know what, this is what I think is probably going to happen. I could be wrong. I always say I could be wrong because I really could be. But I think this is what's probably in your life right now. So number one is I think that you're going to maintain your most important relationships on social media. You're going to take sides and really won't think about it or know what really happened. So you're going to make decisions. You're going to take sides about a conflict between two people, but you really, you won't, you'll just make that decision really quickly or, and you really might not know what happened. You're going to show loyalty to someone on social media when you're conflicted or when you don't want to. You are going to, uh, someone will manipulate or embarrass you or a friend on social media. The next one I put up is you're going to see something on social media that crushes you, like you're going to have a crush on somebody and then you're going to see them with somebody else or somebody's going to tell you that they're not available for something with you and you're going to see them socializing with somebody else. Or you're going to feel like somebody's at a party and deliberately posting pictures to make you feel terrible. Something is going to happen on one of these platforms where you are going to be crushed by what you see. And you are going to want to confront somebody about something on social media, but you will not. So these are the things that I think are probable that young people are going to experience. But for those of you, and I think there are many people here who are working with young people in this, in this field, is that take these things or say like, I think this, this is possible or probable. Am I right? Am I wrong? And what should we add to it? And so what we want is to be able to, when we're talking to young people just in the very beginning, is to set the context for any of the content that we are going to give them. And so we can start with, this is what I think is happening, maybe I'm wrong, and if, you know, tell me yes or no, and then what else is happening? Let's put up other things, and you can even do that anonymously, where you can have young people write it down, you can collect them, you can put it up, you can put it on the whiteboard, whatever your teaching capacity or how you're doing it. But this is, this is about how do we create a learning environment for young people around social media where we are immediately signaling to them that we know some about what their experiences are, but we are not making assumptions and that they can add to this to make context for the content that we are going to deliver them. So we do not give them anything without appreciating and acknowledging their lives, that we don't know all of it, and that they can contribute to this to make this realistic. So that's how I start with young people. And then we go from there. Then we go front to this. So I'm going to move this a little bit so I can see this a little bit more easily. Um, there we go. So, um, so here's what I think is, so we have this, we, lay, we have a lay of the land with the context, but then we take a step back. And this is um, for those of you who are teaching social emotional learning in any capacity or um, connecting that to social media or wanting young people teaching teachers about how to have a sense of belonging in the classroom. This all, this all is integrated with this is that I believe that we have to start with principles, that principles guide our thoughts and our actions. And connected to social media and young people, we are never going to be able to create a social emotional learning programs or lesson plans on technology and social media that describes every single iteration of everything that can go wrong or reflect the complexity of social media. That is impossible. What we need are principles that guide our actions and our thoughts in the way that I describe it to young people is that they are the guardrails that when you imagine you are like driving on a mountain road and it's snowing or raining and it's really hard to see, it's nerve wracking, that principles keep us on the guardrails, they keep us on the road. They are the guardrails that keep us on the road. So we don't know what turn is around the corner. We don't know if things are gonna change, but they keep us on the road safe and steady. So I'm gonna give you the principles that I use with young people on these issues. So the principles that are, we're gonna to commit to treating ourselves and others with dignity. 
no one knows everything together. We know a lot. So as the teacher, as somebody who's worked with young people, I know a lot, but so do the young people. And together we know a lot. Listening is being prepared to be changed by what you hear. I think this is really important for adults and for parents and teachers, because we so often, um, when we are talking to young people about technology, our faces betray the opinions and judgments we have. So we get this look on our face of like horror or disgust or um, thinking that what they're doing is superficial. And of course, then young people are going to disengage from us and not tell us what they're really dealing with when they see that look on our face. So, I mean, we're, we're human beings. So when I have, when I feel that I'm getting that look on my face, I will say to my students, did I just get that look on my face? Did I just get a weird look on my face? What, what did that look just tell you? And then I apologize and say, I'm sorry. I need to go back and listen as being prepared to be changed by what I hear. So I gotta, I gotta get my face. I'm human, but I gotta control my face. Um, we wanna be easy on people, hard on ideas. This goes right to, to cancel culture and social media because our culture, everything we know, but never been sat down and taught is, you, is hard on people, mercilessly hard on people. And because we are so hard on people, we don't have the focus and wherewithal to be hard on ideas, to be rigorous on ideas. So we wanna be counter-cultural. The social media and technology with young people, what I say to them is, so a kid, you know, a kid makes a mistake on social media. We can define what a mistake is, but people are, should be allowed to make mistakes. And having one person make a mistake and then we gang up on them or um, socialize, socially isolate them ostracize them means that we can't figure out what happened and how that child needs support, whatever the support that looks like. And that includes, by the way, parents, because parents can get really judgy about what they see from children and what children are posting on social media. So we want to be easy on people, hard on ideas. We want to validate, not relate, meaning that we feel like you know, I, we can say to young people, I was your age once, I know what it's like. I think it's much, much more effective to say, you know, I was your age once, but I don't know what it's like. I don't know what it's like to grow up without any privacy because parents, excuse me, because parents were posting things on Instagram accounts when kids are a few weeks old. Like, I don't know what that's like. So I really would like to know. I want to listen so that I understand your world better. We're going to recognize young people as the subject matter experts of their lives, and technology is an amazing example of that. And we want, as a principle, that asking for help is a strength, not a weakness. Um, and that one of the things I think we do, um, and I will say like very concretely for you all, is that one of the mistakes we make in education that we have consistently made, including with social emotional learning, is we say, if you have a problem, as you know, to, to our students or to young people in our care. If you have a problem, go talk to an adult. Well, what adult? Because there are some adults who are terrible at, at knowing how to handle when a child comes to them with a problem. It's gonna, is not gonna respond well. So this needs to be actually reframed in schools. If there's one thing I could do, frankly, to like really help kids is I would take away, maybe people will disagree with this, uh, be, uh, with me about this, but, I would take away every tracking app that a kid had that people are trying to get kids to put on their phones. I would take away every single one of those in place of actually sitting down with children um, across the board and saying, asking for help is a strength, not a weakness. Let's think about this as a capacity. So we are going to sit down and you're going to think about the three characteristics that you need in an adult that you are gonna go talk to if something happens on social media that is humiliating to you, overwhelming to you embarrassing to you. Think about the three characteristics that you need in that human being and that adult. All right. Now who now on the other side of that piece of paper, write down who that person is. And if I am that person, you need to know that you can come talk to me about anything. If I have received that honor to be that adult in your life, then I want to know. I might not know the answers to everything, but I will go with you along the way to getting the answers and the support that you need. If we did that systemically in every school in, in the country, our children's lives would be better, safer, more protected. Our relationships with young people would be stronger.
So I can't emphasize enough that this princi these principles that guide our thoughts and our actions can help us to be able to navigate this incredibly complex world that we live in of young people and social media. All right, so let's go to next, to the next thing. I'm gonna ask you, even though this is a keynote, I believe really strongly in asking you all what your thoughts are as we go through this. What is the principle, and I'll put the principles back up in a moment. What is the principle do you wanna focus on to frame your norms with young people in whatever capacity, right? As a parent, as a teacher, as a, in some kind of capacity educator, what are the, what is a norm that you want to focus on? So I'm going to put these back up here and you can put them in the chat if you want and, and, or you can put it on your phone so that after this webinar, um, that you can have things that you remember, right? Um, after we're done. Check my time. Okay. All right, wonderful. Okay, so let's keep going. So I keep on time and we can get to our wonderful panelists too. So um, I have a very um, complicated relationship with the word respect. Um, so respect, and I wanna say this because it goes directly to how young people um, interpret what we are talking about um, on this issue. So respect means, in Latin means to look back at, and it means that respect is earned based on people's actions. And in contrast, and I said this in the beginning with my principle that dignity means to be worthy and that dignity is a given. So respect is a very complicated word for young people because in the culture of young people, especially for kids who are marginalized for socioeconomic reasons, race and ethnicity reasons, this is an incredibly complicated word because in our culture, respect is used as a way to actually demand control and compliance, especially from people who have less power. And young people consistently have the experience of having adults in their lives be in positions of respect and use that position of respect to not treat people with dignity, with worth. We are here on this panel with the National Center for Exploited and Missing Children. We are here, Scam, what do, what do a lot of the people do on this call? Well, what, we help young people come forward and speak their truth against people in positions of power when they are being abused. That is what a lot of people on this call do. The word respect is an insurance policy for people in positions of power to keep children silent when they are being abused. So if we do not pull apart these two words and give respect actually the, the gravitas that it is that it deserves, then what we have is this word, this conflation where young people don't, we use dignity and respect sort of interchangeably, but also young people believe that a person in a position of respect is going to be believed over them. And that keeps them silent when they are being abused or hurt. So I, the, that is the one of one of the reasons why using respect and dignity, especially for the people who are here today, is so powerful to separate these two words and use them um, for the power in which they really, which they really deserve and are more effective and is more reflective of young people's experience. All right. So with that. Um, and I can see people, um, you know, thinking about this. This this is big. This respect and dignity stuff is is big. Um, I've written extensively on it. Also, a woman named Donna Hicks, and during the panel, I'll pop her information in as a colleague of mine that I just is wonderful on these issues that speaks on respect and dignity. So I would encourage you to keep thinking about this. All right. So let's now change, if we've, we've done the principles and we've done dignity and respect, so let's get more granular with young people and talking to them about their emotions connected to social media and technology. So I believe these are the things that are the most important for young people to really get clear on. Getting clear about your emotions empowers your experience to define your experiences. Emotions are real, but they are not permanent. You can change the way you feel. And the more we describe our feelings, the more options we have to understand and communicate them. So when we have a young person who is so embarrassed about something that they did on social media, we've got a, a really important moment there, which was we want to, excuse me, we do want to validate their experience, their feelings, right? Their, um, their, their feelings are real 
to them. And we also want them to be able to know that there's a way to move through it without dismissing the feeling they're having. We never want to come across, obviously, as patronizing or condescending or like, don't worry, it's going to get better. But, you know, one of my least favorite phrases. So to be able to honor the experience and of that they're feeling of, I'm really, you know, I'm so sorry. And this feeling you're having is real and you can change the way that you feel. So these are things that I think, especially when we're connecting, you know, I do a lot of work on social emotional learning. When we are connecting social emotional learning with technology, we tend to go right to the tactics of social emotional learning. Like, you know, what do you do when somebody um, embarrasses you on social media? But we forget to really focus on, well, what is an emotion? What is a feeling? Emotions are, ne- are things that are happening in our brains and we are responding to them. It's a, it's a physical experience. So we don't, t- we tend to sort of leap over that. And I, b- I believe that especially with talking to young people about social media, that we have to go to the very fundamentals, which is what is emotions and how are they regulated? And the more that we can say um, and get more specific about, I'm embarrassed, I'm humiliated. Well, what is that? Let's get more, like, let's ask ourselves, what does that really feel? What are we feeling about that? Why? It's not perseverating, it's getting more granular so that we can understand the experience we're having. The, when, the better we can do that, we can, ex- we can describe it to ourselves and therefore we can describe it to the adults, you know, the people that we go to to ask for help. So that also means that when we do this, young people's emotional intelligence increases And it also means that their anxiety decreases. And so when we're dealing with a young person who's very upset about something that's happening on social media, then we need to be able to do this and quiet their brains so they can think through things more clearly and they're not so desperate. So the question I wanna ask you all is, oh, this isn't, I wrong, hold on, sorry, there we go. So I also think one of those fundamental things for young people is, is that they're feeling emotionally hijacked when things are happening to them on social media that feel out of control. So I think this is one of the grounding things that we need to teach young people and the adults that are teaching young people about social media. So it is the experience of being captured by your emotional reactions. It causes fast thinking, not slow thinking, which young people are going to agree to because they all know that feeling of sitting across from your phone and being like, I have to respond right now. So this is giving a term to the feeling of, oh my gosh, I have to, have to, have to respond right now. The brain processes physical and emotional threats in the same way, which normalizes that feeling that young people get when so when something is happening to them that feels out of control. And it is confusing, overwhelming, and you can hurt people without realizing it. So that young people, when they see this, it gives them a framing for, oh, why did I do that? Why did I do that this morning? Or why did I, you know, on my phone? Or why did I let my friend do this? Or why? It gives a framing for them to understand why they're doing the things they're doing. And when we understand it, that's when we are much more likely to internalize the lessons we need to be able to hold ourselves accountable and regulate ourselves. So we stop having an emotional hijacking moment that controls our behavior so we do something that is maybe unethical or is um, contributes to the problem on social media that happens so easily. All right, so a little bonus question for you all um, is that I think is important because of your your roles um, in education is when, who do you, uh, like where, how, when do you need support when you are emotionally hijacked? Because I think as parents or as teachers that Young people's social media often used, oh, that's my timer, um, oftentimes gets us crazy. So like when I'm a teacher, when I'm teaching and I have an eighth grade, I don't know why I'm saying eighth grade, but when I have a kid, I don't know if you can see me, I, I got my phone and the kid's underneath doing this thing, I can get super emotionally hijacked, meaning highly irritated and want to lash out, right? So so when do you get emotionally hijacked? Identifying that um, is really important as a parent and as an educator. All right, so let's go, let's, I'm gonna move this forward. Here we go. So my last component for what I believe is important for young people about about social media is about literally getting very clear about what boundaries are. So boundaries are the act of making you feel safe in relationships, regardless if it's online or in real life. 
Boundaries are like windows, you can open and close them and boundaries can change. So the way that I'm explaining it to young people with social media is there's this feeling about maintaining relationships that they have to get back right away, right? If something happens on Snapchat, they get snapped or there's something on Instagram, you must, you must reply, you must reply or else somehow that is gonna somehow impact the friendship. And so if we can establish that boundaries, this is the way I'm describing it to young people, that, young, that boundaries are like windows, that you can close them all the way or you can open them a little bit or open them a lot, or you can close them all the way and still see through and still see through what's happening. It makes them feel like because of this changing thing that it feels like it's not so permanent. So if you've got kids who are you know, having to reply um, when they're in class, then you can use the boundaries and windows metaphor to say, well, we, wanna, we need to close the window all the way when you're in class so that you are not responding to your friends. Um, but when you're in the hallway or whatever the school rules or what they're trying to get, you know, the rules are trying to get around, but like, where is the place that you can open up the window a little bit so you then can respond. But this is about boundaries, um, being able to give boundaries for relationships. And yes, I can see that boundaries are, are hard for all of us. And so being able to do that for our kids and model that is literally life-changing and life-saving for them. All right, so let's see where we are. I want to make sure because my time is, yeah, let me go to, so here's what I want to leave you with. What I want to leave you with is, because um, we're going to go into some, um, whoops, into some Q&A, excuse me, hold on one second, please, is, hold on, where is my thing? I just see beautiful, there we go. All right, so um, is it gone now? Yeah, it is gone now, thank you. I did a, a thing by, by, by accident, so then I couldn't see my own thing. Um, all right, so what I want you to think about as the last thing that we do like today with me is we're gonna do some questions, but I also, um, here we go, there we go, now I'm all queued up. So Lori, we can go and do Q&A and then I can wrap it up with our last like question that I wanna ask people who are, who are in, you know, who are in our community right now. Well, Rosalind, I think um, let's get a few reactions. Um, I'll start with Leah Fraley and um, invite all the participants as well to put their reactions in the chat as Leah's talking um, or put your hand up. We'd love to hear from you um, directly as well. So Leah. Uh, no, thank you, Rosalind. That was amazing. Um, there was so much to unpack there. So I'm a mother of four boys, they're adults, but the, um, the the issues around boundaries, the issues around um, emotional hijacking, and and how when they are, I mean, to your question, when they are emotionally hijacked is when I am emotionally hijacked because I become so protective and I don't know how to support them. Um, I think that's it's it's so important for us <laughs> as parents. It's just so difficult to know how to react and not overreact. Mm -hmm. So that I don't see that in. Um, so that they come to me. It's just uh, everything that you said was just amazing. It looks like there's some. <laughs> well, I was over here writing. I'm writing notes about the next time I, I will never have another child. But if I do, what I'm going to do differently. So thank you for that. You're welcome. You know, I think one of the most important things is, um, you know, my kids are 19 and 21, and my 21 year old loves me right now, as and like for a while. And, um, and he and my 19 year old, it finds me highly, highly irritating. Um, but with social media, my older one um, has been, was more obviously, obviously not only addict, like really compelled by, by social media, but his self-esteem was very much impacted by Instagram for the negative, of course. And, um, and so he, we've been, we have been talking more and more about how to create boundaries for himself around social media um, and, and Instagram. Instagram, one of the things that I, I want to be very clear about with Instagram, actually, because it's just for those of you, I think, that, I think, I hope this is applicable, is that we tend to think that Instagram is terrible for girls because of body image. And I think it is just as bad for boys. I mean, or let's, I mean, I don't, I don't like to pit boys and girls, you know, what's worse or whatever there's, you know, let's just say that it is, it is negative for boys self-esteem as well. Um, and um, I think we, I just want to make sure we like, we don't forget about boys and the pressures that they have 
um, for themselves. But when we, when we get emotionally hijacked about our kids and social media, like get off the phone, you know, that kind of stuff. I think one of the things I would do, what I try and do myself, and I would encourage parents to do is to say, what is the under there? There is a reason besides you know, the technology being so good at keeping their attention, which is obviously extraordinary, but there, there is a compelling, understandable reason why they might be like really obsessed on what they're seeing or how they contribute to, or what they're posting or what they're commenting on. Um, because I know with young people that I work with that the complexities of the social dynamics that they're dealing with on social media is extraordinary extraordinarily complex. And so they are making incredibly complex ethical decision-making when it looks like they're just like posting something on Instagram. Mm -hmm. No, thank you for that, yeah. Um, Lori, I think I saw Claudia had her hand up, but it looks like she put the question in the chat. Do we wanna just go through it some is. here? Yeah, um, thank you so much for those that are putting questions in the chat. Um, Rosalind, there's a question about um, a deeper dive into validate, don't relate. Mm. Um, unpack that a little bit around sure. what you mean about um, re relating empathically or follow through yeah. actions, performative, yeah. <laughs> being performative. Of, you'll be you'll be very comfortable hearing that word because um, young people use throw that around a lot. If you just speak a little bit more on that. Sure. So it's really common in, um, for the best of intentions to, um, to say, you know, I know what it's like, to, you know, I was your age once, I, I know what it's like. And then there's this thing about like, it gets better, which I think a lot of people know is not, is not helpful. In education, there is um, a tendency among teachers or, or principals, for example, to be sitting across the table from a parent and say, you know, I have two kids too, I know what it's like. And um, just like in the situation between the principal and the teacher saying that to the parent as an adult saying to a child, um, it actually oftentimes backfires because it does not come across as being empathic. And it doesn't, it, what it often comes across is either patronizing or not taking the time to acknowledge that actually your life might be different. And, um, and certainly, of course, this goes with race and identity kinds of issues as well, that when someone, and, and it comes from, a, yeah, usually it comes from a good place, right, of, I'm, I'm trying to, you, you, please know that I understand what it's like to be you. But what I find is, is that that really is not helpful lots of times. What is more helpful is to say, you know, I actually don't know what this is like for you. You, um, you have different kids than I do, or you are growing up in a different time than me. And I need, and I'm acknowledging that. And by acknowledging that I am treating you with dignity because I see you, I am seeing you. I don't know everything about you, but I see that you are different and that I want to know. And that when I'm curious about that and I say, you know, I, I want to know what that's like for you or, you know, whatever you feel comfortable telling me, then that actually brings the person closer to you. And, um, and so I, I, it's a very powerful reframe of something that I think we often do and don't realize the complexity of the reaction on the other side from people. And so specifically with young people about social media and technology, to be able to acknowledge, because they say it to us all the time, you aren't growing up in the same time that we are. This is different. This is different, is for us to say, I didn't grow up with. A, you know, something in my pocket that is going to give me, you know, what it's, I don't grow up with this. I didn't grow up without privacy. I didn't grow up with this in my, this tool. So I need to know from you what this is like so that then together we can figure out what to do, whatever the problem is. Thanks so much, Rosalind. Um, moms and boys are happy to feel their people are in the room um, with you and Leah. Um, could you speak to how differently boys use social media than with girls? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, there's, there is information when I said, you know, boys are also impacted by Instagram. Um, the thing that I want us to be careful about with social media is that there are, there are differences from research about how girls are impacted by, or how they react when they get upset about what they see on social media versus what boys, how boys respond. I just don't want us to have a binary um, viewpoint about boys' experiences versus girls' experiences, because when we do that, boys and girls pick up on it, and they don't they don't 
they don't talk to us when they need to. Um, so, I mean, the easiest thing I can explain about that, for example, is, you know, when people say boys are easy and girls are hard, and that is, you know, boys might be quieter about their, about for very, you know, other reasons that I could talk about later about why boys don't want to come forward and talk to us sometimes about their feelings, but therefore to assume that they don't have any or that their friendships aren't deeply important to them or that they don't feel left out, for example, when they see something on Snapchat and they weren't invited to something. Um, they might go upstairs and play, or they might go and play video games to distract themselves for two hours. And that, yes, being addict addicted to video games is compelling, but it's also because they want a distraction maybe from the thing that they saw that hurt their heart. So it's, um, and they might have really good friends on that video game when they're playing that really make them feel good. So to understand the complexity of their lives um, and the integration of what is happening and that they always have, they usually have feelings, deep feelings about their friendships. And to just know that is something as we go and talk to them about technology, I think is the thing that makes them strengthen. It makes, it, it makes our relationship stronger instead of just being oppositional about you've been on that, but you've been playing that game for too long. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, you're you're right in the zone, so we'll keep you there. There's two questions about sort of teens and social media, um, how how to navigate, um, sorry, engagement and reactions as they move through adolescence, as they move from teenagers to young adults. Um, if you could speak a little bit about that, and I think you're headed that direction anyway. Yeah, and I'm sure the panel is going to do this as well. And I know. Look, I think the issues of sexting, Lori, you and I, you know, have talked about this a lot. And um, I, I will say that um, we could do, we obviously can do a whole panel on this. And I think if we did, that we have to have young people participate because the way in which they see um, sexuality, explaining their, showing their sexuality, flirting, all of those things, because this tool has been something that they have used as they have grown into their adolescence, it is that it is a natural extension of their adolescent and sexual development to use this tool to communicate their developing sexuality with other people. And that is a very uncomfortable thing for adults to acknowledge and recognize. And, um, and that is ubiquitous to young people. And then, of course, we also have a segment of young people who are vulnerable to adults or older people who are going to target them for predation. So, um, so what I believe about this entire topic is that, th like, the most important, the most important for me, because I also want to give time to the panel about this topic as well is that we have to level set with young people about, and this is exactly how I say it to them, is I say, I don't think there's anything unethical about falling in love. I think there's nothing unethical about having a crush on somebody and wanting them to love you or think you're sexy. I think there's nothing wrong, nothing unethical about wanting to try out your, your developing sexuality um, and like and show that to the world because that is adolescent development. There's nothing unethical about that. We have to understand the context of the world that you live in that sometimes wants to seek to manipulate that or exploit that because we want you to have agency and autonomy to make decisions that you want that are best for you. So we have to understand the context in which you're living and all of those things are not unethical. What is unethical is to take those, those very natural understandable uh, decisions and, and actions that young people take and take that and use that to manipulate or humiliate someone else. That is unethical. And so if, as a young person, you are living in a context where sometimes people are ostracized, alienated, shamed, embarrassed because of these, of these things that they're doing. That right there, that is what we have to talk about as a group, right, amongst our peers. That is unethical. And so what are we going to do to hold ourselves accountable and hold other people accountable when they participate in the humiliation of other people? Because other people's embarrassment and humiliation should never, ever be someone else's entertainment. So, um, and like as a capstone to that, I think one of the things that's really important for young people is that they're making decisions about guilt and innocence on a whole host of things of their peers without actually taking the time, and, and none of us, and very few of us are 
by the way, but they're, they're not taking the time to really figure out or uh, like decide guilt, innocence, entertainment, humiliation. They're not taking the time to decide that. So I think one of the things we need to talk to them about is slowing that down and then giving them the internal motivation and mechanisms to recognize their emotions, what's happening in their body when that happens, and how are they coming to the decisions about guilt and innocence and therefore how they speak to and, and treat that person, which is why dignity is such an important principle to go back to because everybody deserves inherent worth to be treated with inherent worth. Yeah, um, thank you. We have a couple questions in the chat that we will filter into the panel and Rosalind will be there with the panelists. So we're going to, um, so please keep those questions coming. Um, we will get to them. I'm gonna let Rosalind ask all of you a question um, <laughs> yeah. or two maybe now. Yeah. And then we'll so the what I wanna do, and this will take, well, where's my, my, my mouse? Um, is I wanna leave you all with, um, so where is it? Come on, where, go. oh, I need to do this correctly. All right. So I did want to leave with one, uh, one thing of if, if an adult comes to, you know, if a kid comes to an adult and says like, I'm going to tell you this, you can't, you have to promise not to say anything. And I think this is a really important thing of, especially because teachers feel so overwhelmed or parents can feel so overwhelmed that they have to make this promise and you can't. So I think it's a, an important sentence script to say like, I can't make that promise, but I can promise if we need to involve another adult, we will choose that person together. I think that's an important sentence script um, response from people. And if kids are waiting to tell you, I think, and you're like, and then you freak out, I think it's another sentence script, important sentence script to say, I'm guessing you had a really good reason for not telling me earlier. So when you're ready, I'd really like to understand what that reason was. And Lori, by the way, helped me reframe. I don't know, Lori, if you remember this, but help me reframe some of these sentence scripts to be really understanding of young people if they were on the receiving end of predation. Um, but I, I really believe that young people oftentimes will wait for a while for all different kinds of understandable reasons to tell us things. And then when they do, we sort of freak out sometimes about it. And so being able to have that, that reaction of like, wow, I'm guessing you had a really good reason to for not telling me. And I'd really like to know when, or wow, I freaked out before. And I really, I thought about it. I really wish I had handled that differently. You must have had a good reason not to tell me. When you're ready, please tell me. So those are the two sentence scripts I wanted to leave you with. And my last thing is to ask you, so when you came in today already, what do you now, this is 20 seconds, is what do you now know, but now see differently? So I want you to think about like, what would you remember of something you said uh, or thought, excuse me, something somebody said in the chat, something I said that you want to remember? So what did you come in today knowing? Because there's a lot of expertise in this room, but and now see differently. So if you can take 20 seconds to um, put that in the chat, that would be awesome. And Rosalind, as we let them put that in the chat, I, yeah. I, I know that anyone who's worked with extensively with young people, those of you who are educators, um, sometimes we find ourselves reassuring parents that repair is possible, that your kids talk about you um, at, at, at school. We hear your words at school. You may think they're pinging off, um, but we very often are hearing phrases that could only have come from a mom. So. Um, understanding that they will give you so many chances to fix things. Yeah. Has that been your experience, Rosalind? Absolutely. Yeah. God bless them for that. Yeah. <laughs> so these are the comments. I don't know if you want to comment on them, Rosalind. No, no. Let's go to okay. the panel. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you so, so much um, for that really thought-provoking talk. We, we're going to switch gears into sort of really nuts and bolts advice from our panel of experts who we're so delighted have joined us today. And they're going to be um, spotlighted on your um, video. So if, if it looks like it's only the speaker, um, go ahead and play with um, speaker view or gallery view to see what works best for you. Um, so we have Chelsea Collins, who is our Interim Director of Family Programs here at SCAN of Northern Virginia. Um, Samantha Clark, Interim CEO and COO of Laws, Domestic Violence and Sex, I'm sorry, Sexual Assault Services. Um, Sam is also a Board Vice President of Equality um, Loudoun. 
and um, a huge contributor to our Loudoun County Trauma-Informed Community Network. And we're also welcoming Mike Hill, the Director of Digital Media, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. You may know them as NICMIC, and I hope you know if you don't already, um, that NICMIC runs the National Cyber Tip um, Hotline uh, online and partners with a lot of national and international law enforcement on the prevention and response to online sexual abuse. So I just want to thank all of you for your very important work. Um, before we start with um, the questions I've prepared, I wanted to give, um, if anyone has a reaction to something from the um, keynote that you'd like to call out or mention or double down on, um, just like a one sentence, um, I, I give you that opportunity now. If not, we'll just jump into the questions. Sam, really? you've unmuted. I was going to say, I unmuted just because I am incredibly grateful to everything Rosalind said. I, it resonated with me as a child welfare professional and someone who works in victim services. The one thing that really stood out to me uh, among many was this idea of autonomy and agency. I think sometimes as we struggle a lot with um, our fear and worry that children might be harmed or that children are doing something that, that we struggle with understanding, that we want to take that, right? We want to take that autonomy. We, we don't understand it. We, we worry about ha children having that agency and making good decisions. Um, and I think emphasizing the fact that that, um, that autonomy and, and that agency um, and, and allowing children in, in our lives to have that is really, really important. Um, and we can work with uh, the young people in our lives to strengthen that and to give them the knowledge and skills to be safer and to and to, um, to to navigate these challenges in their lives. But when we take that power and control, right, um, we don't we don't strengthen their ability to do that. So I really appreciate Rosalind highlighting that. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, Chelsea, did you want to say something? I did. Um, first of all, thank you, Rosalind. Um, everything you said was just gold. Um, but I really loved the, the, the portion about respect and dignity, kind of thinking in, you know, kind of respect in the, the power and control kind of terms. And um, I had never thought about that before. And I think that that was really a really great portion. So thank you. Yeah. Hey, Mike. Yeah, just real quick. Uh, it was it was wonderful to hear, hear you speak today, Rosalind. And um, coming back to what you said about adults and it's just not any adult and you know i'm the father of two little girls and so we're just starting on this road of technology you have an eight-year-old and a six-year-old but teaching and with our net smarts program at the national center what a trusted adult is in a child's life um because a trusted adult is not every single adult and you need to identify these with your kids to let them know who in their lives or someone that they can actually turn to and i think that's such an important thing for parents to understand from an early age with your children so i mean and just and, and just about the boundaries and the emotional reactions and, and having your child be able to come to you if they need to talk to you about something that they know that you're not going to overreact that they can they can tell you and you'll listen it's so important yeah i mean social emotional learning is child protection right i mm -hmm. mean we uh, and vice versa um, mike i'm gonna stay with you because um i think we look to nick mick for numbers we look to nick mick um to to let us know the real real so the mm -hmm. pandemic has changed the world of our youth. We, uh, all of us in child protection saw it coming. Um, what are, what are, I'm gonna go to all of you, what you're hearing from your organizations and your constituencies about the effect of the pandemic. And I'll start with you, Mike. Sure, you mentioned uh, the national uh, reporting mechanism, the cyber tip line, the National Center for Mis Exploited Children. Um, I'm gonna go ahead from now on and say neck mix, so I don't have to refer to the long, um, <laughs> The long title, but um, we have our cyber tip line data and, and it gets released every single year. And so um, we've saw an increase over the last two years of the pandemic. And before I talk about the numbers, um, it's not, it's this isn't in any way to scare people from the internet or to scare children from using the internet. I mean, the internet is such a wonderful tool and it's just having the right conversations to be able to do it. But we saw a 35% increase in reports around 20, 29.3 million reports last year. Um, and the majority of those over 90% are child sexual abuse material um and a you know five or six years ago we probably would have said called that child pornography and i know not everyone may, may be familiar with the term csan child sexual abuse material but i think it's important that we know that we use that term over child pornography because child pornography neglects the abuse the child has experienced it is not voluntary um, but that is the majority of the reports that we're seeing but then we're also seeing um, a decent amount of online enticement of, of people trying to entice children for acts online um, grooming behaviors things like that so 
um, even though the numbers seem high, there are things uh, that we can do to prevent and, and help our children as they navigate their online lives. Thanks so much, Mike. Sam, what are you seeing? Um, Laws runs a child advocacy center, um, which is response. Um, most of the people in this room might might be aware of it, but some might not. So before you answer, could you just give us a little thumbnail about Laws and um, the child advocacy center? Absolutely. Thank you, Lori. Um, so here in Loudoun County, Laws is the designated uh, provider of comprehensive services for domestic violence and sexual assault services uh, for victims in our jurisdiction. Additionally, we are the like, parent organization for the Loudoun Child Advocacy Center. And at the Child Advocacy Center, it is a multidisciplinary approach to ensuring that children who have experienced child abuse or child sexual abuse um, have a child-focused, trauma-informed uh, experience when having to um, be part of an investigation following that trauma. And so that is our Child Advocacy Center. We have our forensic interviewers and our family advocates on staff who make sure that that is a trauma-informed response following um, the experience of abuse that that child has encountered. And we support the safe caregiver as well as the child and our law enforcement and child welfare partners uh, in that multidisciplinary response. And so what we're seeing, um, interestingly, to back up what Mike has said, is also an increase in the exposure to harm online uh, here in Loudoun, Loudoun County. We're seeing not only um, children experiencing um, exploitation through um, online platforms that our, our participants here today um, identified earlier in our time together, but it's not just the exploitation, it's that peer-on-peer kind of conflict and, and these kind of issues that are increasing just anxiety and stress and depression and just this these kind of uh, multitude of issues because children have been online extensively in the last couple of years. And so what we're seeing um, is that manifesting in a lot of different ways. Um, children are not necessarily seeing online as as all bad, right? There are many, many, many positives to being online. And Rosalind shared those with us. I love that she said it was about connecting and creating and consuming, right? There's so many positives. What we're seeing now is we kind of exit the pandemic, fingers crossed, right? That's what we're all hoping for as we continue in this forward direction um, is that those boundaries, again, we talked a little bit about boundaries already, is that those boundaries are, are um, becoming increasingly kind of unclear and fluid. And so some of these experiences that they have navigated online um, are now kind of entering into the real world. And, and there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of um, things that have gone from being being perhaps isolated in an online environment to becoming a lot more impactful and unsafe in the lives of um, the children that we're seeing actually come into uh, the Child Advocacy Center after experiencing um, real harm and real exploitation due to online engagements that they've um, experienced. And so I think one of the things that we're really um, navigating, uh, not only with our children in uh, understanding the harm that they've experienced and providing support around that, but is navigating the real concern and confusion that the um, safe caregivers in their life have around what what is this? What did it ha what happened? How did it happen? How did I not see it? Um, because um, social media and the engagement in these platforms has become so normalized that parents are concerned and anxious about how they're missing things, why their children aren't coming to them, um, what do they do when their children do come to them. So these are very real and very important conversations that we're starting to have uh, fairly regularly now at the CAC. Yeah, thanks for mentioning parents. Chelsea, what are you hearing from them? Yeah, so this kind of goes along with what Sam was saying. Um, but, you know, there's just so many different apps, platforms, games, ways that a, a child can engage on social media that it's just easy to overlook, you know, the harm. You know, take TikTok, for example. You know, there's so many funny videos, cute dogs, you know, et cetera. And it's just easy to, to, to forget about the almost the dark side you know, what's on the other side of TikTok. Um, but I also think that parents are also having, you know, difficulty balancing the, how do I keep my child safe and monitor them, but also keep that healthy relationship? What does that boundary look like? How do I, you know, build that and maintain it? And, but also ensure that they're doing, you know, appropriate things on the internet, you know, engaging appropriately. Um, and so I think, you know, those are kind of what I'm seeing and hearing from parents. 
Yeah, let's go to Mike because really that's what Nick Mick does is <laughs> advise um, parents on how to prevent harm. So where are you, how are you framing um, prevention with parents? Um, what are the areas you're wanting to talk to them about? With any app that their child may be on, um, number one, it's just, it's, it's having that dialogue with your children and starting from an early age, even before they're on, like before they're 13, before they have a chance to get on social media profiles, because now they're going to start on things like when they're young, they might play Roblox, they might be on Facebook Kids Messenger, they might start that communication. And that's good for them to, to learn how to use these tools. But, um, you know, making sure that when they get into that world where they're starting to to use apps. So you have to have guidelines and boundaries to your children about what they are and are not allowed to do and, and trying to have those conversations. And monitoring software, we get asked about a lot. Um, a lot of parents will say, what can I buy? What monitoring software? But I think what parents need to understand is that none of those are gonna guarantee your child's safety. Um, the time and the dialogue that you have with them and the trust that you build with them is gonna be the most important way and then asking them about what they're doing, like asking them about their online lives. What are they using? And um, really understanding those apps yourselves. Every single app, including TikTok or Instagram has privacy settings. And a lot of these organizations do a lot of a real good job trying to inform. Um, and I know it's not the easiest thing to tell your kids about privacy settings, but um, that's just the recommendation that we have that you talk to them and then you look into the apps yourself and try to have a good understanding about it, about who your children may be talking to. Are their accounts even private? Um, we've asked parents that before. Do you know if your kids' accounts are private? And they don't even, they don't know, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think um, one of the things that, um, Sam, do you have a comment? Do you wanna talk a little bit about prevention? Cause I know the CACs really, yeah. really wanna hit that, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And no, I'm happy to speak to that. I think one of the things that we can absolutely do is to make sure that we are acknowledging um, for, for parents that these conversations are difficult. And, and that what we can do is we can work with parents to take the shame and stigma, um, work with their children to take the shame and stigma out of some of these conversations and create a space where um, they are able to have conversations that um, feel comfortable for them. So it's hard to, you know, it'd be great if we could, um, we could get way ahead of the problem and prevent harm from happening to children. Mm -hmm. But what we really want to do is create an environment in, within families for parents and children, um, for adults, um, uh, safe adults and children to be able um, to allow a space that when that children, that child, that young adult thinks they may have made a mistake because we all make mistakes, right? We all, um, that is that is human behavior that we can feel like we can have a conversation about that and it won't result in a punishment or a consequence or a fear or shame that it will result in feeling supported or heard. And I can come to you about anything. I know Rosalind spoke about this earlier, um, but we shouldn't feel scared to have these conversations and to um, broach these subjects because I think in terms of prevention, if the only time we feel like we have to talk about this is after a harm has occurred, mm -hmm. right? After something bad has happened because I have no other choice, right? Um, then, you know, that's, that's after an adverse impact, right? But what we really want to do is to be able to create safety around the conversations to say, I, I think this, you know, and this is making me uncomfortable. But if we as adults are uncomfortable in that space, you know, children in our lives are going to be uncomfortable in that space, too. And so we should be able to um, be in a space that's comfortable enough that our child can come to us, for example, if they if they feel like they may have lost an image or lost control of an image or something like that. Um, so creating foundations of trust um, that allow those conversations to be had in the event that something might happen or I don't know what to do versus after uh, something has happened or a harm has occurred. 
Thanks, Pam, for raising that. I think um, I'm going to go to Mike for sort of the what to do part, but I want to go to Chelsea really quickly before that and just say what else are parents sort of really uncomfortable about? I think um, a lot of young people think their parents are doing an okay job of monitoring. Um, what are the areas you hear from parents where they feel like they're not um, handling it well or it's confusing? And then we'll go for after you to Mike to sort of see what those solutions might be. Yeah, I think that um, when we do talk about having, you know, those harder conversations, um, I think those are sometimes the more difficult, especially when it comes around like, you know, sexting and sending nudes and kind of that, you know, we've all, I think Rosalind said it, just the budding sexuality that's happening around that age. Um, and I think that um, just that is a very uncomfortable thing for parents, you know, to think about your child kind of growing, you know, getting and growing up into that. Um, and I think that, um, Lori, correct me if I'm wrong, we are going to be inputting a kind of conversation starter sheet and some, some resources, correct? Yes, okay, cool. Um, and so I know that, um, I, I know that when they think about having those conversations, they always are like, I don't even know where to start. What do I even talk about? What do I do? Um, and you can kind of spin off into that um, kind of mindset. So just having, I think even something that, um, you know, can kind of help parents guide like, what do I even need to talk about is super helpful. Oh, you're muted. Um, Mike, help us because tip sheets, we need them. Um, hard for us to remember as soon as we catch up with the age yeah. our kids are, they grow into another age and then it's a whole different kind of conversation. It is and technology is always changing. So these tip sheets are, are not evergreen in a way. You have to keep updating them. Um, you know, internet safety, we were teaching internet safety at the National Center uh, in 2002 when I started there. And at that point, sexting wasn't a term. Cyberbullying wasn't a term. It wasn't even used in the news. Um, sextortion um, and all these terms you have to you have to you know sort of adapt to the technology, and then parents have to adapt, and so do children who are growing up with it. Um, but one of the questions like in the chat was conversation starters, and Chelsea was just getting to that. We have so many tip sheets, and I have a couple of them printed out here: protecting your kids online 2.0, how to start these conversations. Um, Talk about sexting with your kids, um, you know, internet safety at home. Um, if you go to missingkids.org slash net smarts, NETM, oh, we'll get those later. I'm not going to spell it out now, but um, there's so much out there. And I know it's not easy, um, especially if you're not in the field and you're unfamiliar with everything. But, um, but asking your kids those questions, um, they're not going to tell you everything, but you, you should always ask, right? Keep, keep asking. They're not always going to say everything, but the best part is that you just keep trying. Um, and when it comes to sexting, and I think Rosalind made a good point about this, about um, it's okay. Kids are curious about sex. They're going to ask about it. They're going to talk about it. They're going to take pictures. And then what's appropriate, right? Um, what's not appropriate is um, sending that picture to someone else. If you have a picture from, say, a boyfriend or girlfriend, um, you're violating their trust, and you don't have a right to decide who gets to see someone else's body. And that's where the line is drawn. And those are the kind of conversations you can have about that kind of thing. Yeah, well, and, we, um, oh yeah, I'm sorry. I just was I when we were talking beforehand, you'd said even you, right, professional in the field, mm -hmm. um, see that your kids make mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. See that you know you you can teach them and show them, and things are going to happen. Yeah, and, and the last point is um, the TikTok um, video. We uh, we're on TikTok now, and it's been really nice for NECMEC to finally be able to reach that young demographic with prevention and with the, the, those conversations that kids really want to have that they may not have a chance to have. TikTok is not all about dancing. I mean, there's some serious conversations. There's survivor stories on TikTok. There is um, kids talking about um, just reaching out for help. Um, and one of the videos we put up is, are your nudes out there? Um, do you have nudes out there? Um, and using the language that kids use to talk about it. And the response that we got, and this is just overnight, we put this up, we've done it before, but we did it yesterday. Over 500 comments about, yes, what can I do? I Yes, thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, I have them out there. I wish I knew this when I was 13. I was groomed. And one kid just said that uh, he was, um, he felt like by doing that, he was being validated and praised by his peers that he wasn't getting by his parents at home. So they're looking for acceptance elsewhere. Um, but we have uh, an area called missykids.org slash take it down where step by step we can help children go to those different ISPs and learn how you can get your images removed. It's not the end, you know, if they're out there. Um, so we just need to make sure that we, they know that. And when they find that out, they're extremely happy to know. Thank you for that. Um, I will add that SCAN and LAWS has entered in a collaboration um, to create training for parents 
um, a one hour training for parents on prevention of online sexual abuse um, that we'll be rolling out in May. And you'll be getting information about that in the email at the end. And Mike has perfectly segued us into just kind of a little final segment where I'm going to ask the panelists and Rosalind as well. So if we could pin her up, that would be great or spotlight her. Um, the first prompt I had, just one sentence or your first reaction, a few words, um, would be TikTok. And Mike started out with good and bad, right? Not just dance videos, but some serious content as well. Um, Chelsea, TikTok, why do you, what's your response? TikTok. Uh, one line. Uh, one line. Uh, I, always, I always get dog videos for whatever reason. <laughs> <laughs> so your, your feed reflects what you're looking at so parents yeah. might be thinking TikTok is all dog videos and it's yeah. not the feed their children are seeing um, i'm gonna go to sam and and um rosalind um as well TikTok. any any reaction i think for for me when i think about TikTok, it's not a platform it goes back to like um uh, i think it was rosalind that had said um i don't know what it is like for you and it's acknowledging the difference, um, mm -hmm. the different, uh, the differences in in who we are and who they are. And for me, it's like I don't know TikTok, but I know that the children that are engaging in our services and the children in our, you know, children and youth in our community are. And it's an opportunity for me to start a conversation. Tell me about that. Share with me why you mm -hmm. like that. Tell me what you tell me. Tell me what you are, what you like about it, or what do you what you're seeing, or what you do on there, um, so that I can understand who you are more. And it's a conversation starter. It's an opportunity for me to understand, um, and for us to understand their perspective, what's important to them, how they connect, what their interests are, as opposed to me being like, I don't get it, mm -hmm. right? It's a chance yeah. for me to step into their space because trust me, I don't get it. <laughs> okay, but right. that's, that's centering. Yeah, that's centering me, <laughs> and that's not going to allow them to feel safe and and trust me. And so I I see it as a conversation starter and an opportunity for learning. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Roz. One line on parental controls it, or parental tracking. I oh, I don't like them. I don't like them. I'm sorry, people. I don't like them. I know we can have a big discussion about it, but boy, would I rather have young people have um, adults who see them in real life and be able to do the things that we've all been talking about, Samantha, we've all been talking about. I, that's what I think is so much more powerful than those apps. Um, awesome. So, okay. okay. I'm um, going to do last. Wait, hey, Lori, I just yeah. want to say on TikTok, the thing that helped me a lot because I've been in the crosshairs of a lot of these very contentious interactions between teachers and parents and a teacher and a kid gave me this um, thing on TikTok this of, of are you smart and it really brings when I'm down it actually on a positive note it really um, it really feeds my heart and it makes me remember how much I love working with kids. It's this guy named Laurent and he just asks like, are you smart to these kids? And it just always makes me feel better. So I just wanted to share that because because it, it's been a hard year. Thank you, it has. Mike, um, one, one word on family agreements or one sentence on family agreements? On family agreements, um, just, just- One word. That. <laughs> yeah, a sentence, a sentence. Let's give you a sentence. I'm going to give um, everyone a last word. <laughs> I, I, I totally agree with Rosalind on the monitoring software stuff. It's about it's about Same recognizing thing. their their own privacy and that they are, you know, growing and um, just having guidelines, um, just set guidelines in your household. Um, someone online asked, like, what about I, my guidelines versus another parent's guidelines? One of the chat questions. You can only control your own. Um, you can't control anyone else and it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be the exact same as your child's friends, parents. Second. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much, panel. Um, I am, I'm going to say to the participants that if there is anything you came here wanting to learn, please put it in the chat. Um, we want to make sure you don't leave with a question not answered by this panel, and we will see that you get an answer. Um, I am going to thank um, Mike and Sam and Chelsea and Rosalind so much um, 
for your expertise. I know that you welcome us sharing your contact information. If anyone has questions or concerns, we will do that um, in the follow-up information. And thank you again for helping us at least get this conversation started or, or pushed a little further down the road. So thank you all. Thank um, you all. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, panelists. Um, Thank I'm you. gonna turn to um, the, the very last phase of our presentation today. And I want you very much to stay on because this is going to be your Friday afternoon oasis. Um, it is going to be conducted by our absolute favorite, Zen Master. Um, and I, I hope she doesn't feel offended that I referred to her that way, Dr. Suzanne Nixon. Um, we're going to put her info, uh, her link in our chat, but you should know she's a licensed professional counselor. Suzanne is the conductor of the Quiet Waters podcast, which is a series of weekly guided contemplative talks that nurture, and this is my favorite part, because as you can imagine, they nurture stillness and stability, something I really need in my life. Um, and she is, of course, a um, favorite contributor to the Loudoun County Trauma-Informed Community Network. Um, so I'm going to uh, leave it to you, Suzanne. Thank you so much. And uh, this has been a wonderful program. And I have to applaud all the guests that have been speaking. And I just wanna say, as I do this meditation guide it with you, it's really looking at what Rosalind had said that meditation is a way of beginning to emotionally regulate herself. And so think of it as a skill. It's also a method for beginning to self care, to care for yourself. Because a lot of different, there are a lot of different reasons why people meditate, but I want you to take those two away as it relates right now to this program, self care and emotionally regulating. So I invite you to take a moment to pause, to pause from thinking and to consciously connect with yourself, with your body, within. So if you feel most comfortable, sit in your chair in a relaxed position, close your eyes, have your hands folded on your lap and begin to take a nice deep breath. You've been in a cognitive headspace for almost an hour and a half. It's now time to get into the body space, to move within and to remind yourself who you really are. So with awareness, take a fresh cycle of breath, elongating your breath, inhaling to the count of three or four, holding your breath, and exhaling to a count of three or four. This rhythm of breath is a natural way of calming down your central nervous system, calming down your thoughts and your body. The simple action of deep breathing, with awareness and with presence. Let your breath be an anchor point, a segue or a touchstone, for connecting in this felt sense way. Now experience your breath extending down to your diaphragm, into your abdomen, and let this awareness strengthen your inner anchor and be a stronghold for grounding yourself within. I'm gonna pause and say, no, Emily's trying to work some music. And you may wanna lower it just a little bit as it's coming in and out. So as you breathe with that deeper intention, moving your awareness down the midline of your body, sinking into your belly, allow yourself to extend that awareness into your feet. There's a beautiful flow of energy and breath that flows fluidly throughout your body. Your body yearns to feel it, to experience it. Your body yearns to stay steady in, to be nurtured. And our breath 
is our natural mechanism for doing that. As you breathe down your midline, feel the energy in your legs and your feet. Be aware of how your feet touch the floor, touch the ground beneath you. Feel the soles, the bottom of your feet. And if you're sitting and touching the floor, give a little push, a little bit of weight into your feet. This deepens your connection to the ground, to the earth, and can help you become more stable, more solid, more steadfast. Breathing in and breathing out. As you feel the weight in your feet and you feel Mother Earth supporting you, imagine roots coming out from the soles of your feet like trees and plants and flowers. Allow yourself to feel these roots extending into the earth, connecting you deeper and deeper into a support system that is always there for you. We may forget that we are nature, and nature is here for us. So in this moment, remind yourself of that. Remind yourself of the connection and the deep sense of belonging you have with the earth. When we're lost or confused or feeling out of sorts, we don't feel like we belong. There is a place to go to. It's breathing with deep awareness, deep and breathing with deep consciousness and connecting the energy of us to the energy of the earth and allowing ourselves to be supported in this terrain of belonging. Breathing in and breathing out. Feeling the fertile soil that's within you and the fertile soil you're connecting with. Like an oak tree, when you steady in and root in, you strengthen your stronghold. Experience that now. Be with that in awareness and hold back any judgment that you may have. If this is new to you, just allow yourself to accept your experience and appreciate that you're just participating in this moment with practice, guided meditations become easier. As we begin to close, I want to read a beautiful poem, a short poem by Lee Fitch Fisher on stability. So as I read this, feel the energy of your connection within, feel your body sense, feel the calm perhaps that's been evoked. And as I speak the poem, continue to listen in, listen deeply and breathe. This poem is called Stability. The wind is taunting you, reaching out to you, tempting you. But you are the trunk of the 200 year old tree, stable and unmoving against the worst of winds. You have that. You have that now in these few moments of experience and remind yourself moving forward with each step and with each new breath that you can be steady, that you are steady. Remind yourself of that when you feel unsteady and breathe and connect your roots to the place of your deepest belonging. Thank you.
Slowly open your eyes, gazing downwards towards the floor. Gently move your body back and forth and bring forward this energy that comes forth from you from these few moments. Thank you. So much. Uh, that was perfect for a Friday afternoon. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, a couple of things first um, before you go, we're raffling off three parenting self-care kits, baskets, um, to those who complete a post-event survey. Um, so I think we'll either be putting it in the chat or sending a message following. Um, so please complete that um, and we'll let you know uh, if you win. It includes a, a number of items for you as parents, but also uh, for you, uh, for your self-care. So um, please enter that. And then we'll also be having, I think Lori shared and uh, Samantha shared that we're gonna have two follow-up trainings for parents and professionals. So we want to give you access to that. Please go um, sign up for that. When you see it, we'll be sending an email uh, after this with a number of different things, including that. Please sign up. Uh, we want to keep engaged and talking about this. Um, so thank you so much uh, for coming today. Um, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to Rosalind. Uh, we are incredibly grateful to be a part of this community. All right. Have a good one.